So my code uh, won in court. Big man. Uh, yes, it was, that was not a decentralized payment protocol at the time. That was a centralized, but the same principles apply. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mutual Knowledge. I am Gautier Lamot, your host, and today I am blessed to have the Mutual Knowledge guy, François René Rideau, a.k.a. Faré, my business partner, co-founder, and president of Mutual Knowledge Systems, Inc. Hi, Faré. Nice to have you here. Bonjour, Gautier. Bonjour. So, Faré, first question. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and about your long experience in the field of computer science, programming, cybernetics, and all these fields combined? So, wow. Uh, I was raised uh, in a French Vietnamese family, so I was always interested in topics such as freedom, etc. And my background, academic background, was as a researcher in computer science, specialized in programming language, semantics, and distributed systems. My undefended thesis is about the semantics of programming languages that are reflective and the semantics of reflection in general. Um, May I ask uh, from a Vietnamese family for our listeners uh, the implication why, why we're interested <laughs> in freedom because of a Vietnamese family? Well, uh, Vietnam was overrun by communists after having been colonized by the French and uh, protected then by the Americans and um, <laughs> a protection that didn't help very much. Mm. And so what is freedom it has always been uh, an important question. And also being able, the advantage and disadvantage of not fitting, uh, not fitting well, you don't fit, but at the same time, you can see things from a different and better perspective, you have more uh, to the recul, more perspectives to see things that others don't see. So that's, yeah, that, that's cool. And so how did you start your journey in the, in the field of computer science? Well, computer science, uh, I suppose I was really playing plenty of video games when I was a kid and I wanted to build maybe games when I was an adult. But I also liked the fact that you can say things and the things happen. And you can say things properly. And I always like mathematics. My father was a mathematician. And you can manipulate representations and change representations and change point of view. And this is this is what makes computer science fun. It's the opposite of like live performance, at least to me. It is uh, writing the perfect composition, writing, understanding the things. I have a friend who, who had the saying, the hacker is someone who figured things out and made something cool happen. And that's what I like, uh, figuring things out and making something cool happen, making the world better through understanding. And it's not for everyone, but that's for me and that's for what people are called uh, hackers or something like that in the, the positive sense. So I reckon you started your career in France and uh, at the time you studied formal methods and also payment systems. Can you tell us more about that? Well, I didn't study uh, payment systems. I, I studied formal methods. And at some point, one of my first jobs as a consultant was to prove the correctness of a payment uh, protocol. And uh, there's a long story about that. Actually, the, the, the people who wrote the initial payment protocol had, had mistakes on them. So as we wrote the proof, we had to change the protocol to, to fix the mistakes. And then they tried to sue the company saying that we didn't prove the right thing. And things happen badly for them. I mean, they lost a lot of suit. There's our experts say, no, no, <laughs> the proof says the proof is correct and says like, uh, this is part of the method. You can't say the proof is not the proof. And yes, if they, were, if they had to fix bugs in your protocol, it, it's your fault and they did the right thing. They didn't do the wrong proof that your protocol was right when it was wrong. They, they did the right proof that once we fix the protocol a little bit, it's right. So anyway, so that was a different story. But um, so my code uh, won in court. Hmm. <laughs> Big man, <laughs> good job. And uh, uh, but yeah, uh, yes, it was, that was not a decentralized payment protocol at the time. That was a centralized protocol, but the same principles apply. 
directly to decentralized payments. So you were already securing payment protocols before it was cool and before it was mainstream in the blockchain field. All right. Yeah. And so this career led you all the way to Google. Yes. Through, uh, what happened is that I, at first I was in, um, in academia and I found I don't fit in academia because I want to build things. And especially in French academia, it's about the understanding part, but without too much of the building part. Or we build a prototype and then we're happy and, and uh, industry is uh, people. And conversely, the industry people in France, are, oh, well, we're doing practical things and theory we don't care about. So I, I didn't really fit in France. And eventually I moved to, to the US where I joined a company called ITA Software that was building mm -hmm. software for the airline industry in Lisp. And Lisp is a language that I care a lot about. Uh, language that was associated with artificial intelligence back in the days, but that's really a, a language that is very flexible, is a language about thought and organizing the thoughts around the the thing, the domain you are trying to, to describe or act upon. So it's all about understanding the domain and building the ideal language and list the language in which to build the other language. And then you build your software in this domain specific language. So that's the approach we were having to build an airline reservation system. We were acquired by Google eventually because they actually cared about our search engine, which became Google Flights. Oh. And eventually, and so they were not interested in the reservation system that we were working on. And eventually they killed it. And that really hurt me. Like I was feeling like, wow, I spent six to eight years on that thing, me and like in the end, a hundred other engineers and just kill it and didn't didn't sell it. It was worth maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. But the, the board at Google at the time was a billion dollar. If it was worth less than a billion dollar, it's not worth it. So they killed it. It was like hundreds of millions of dollars and years of work of, of capital destroyed. They had it, it really hurt me. Like I feel like when a large company acquires a smaller company, it they should realize that one company know something that the other doesn't. Obviously, if, if you're the bigger and the other smaller, well, you, you have something they don't. And, but conversely, if you need to acquire them rather than build it in-house, because they have something you don't. So mergers and acquisition should be more about merging and understanding what's right and wrong about each company or what's better or worse about each company and, and merging the best of the both instead of trying to, uh, oh, we don't understand, we we'll throw it away and we we'll throw we throw the good with the bad, and why did you pay a uh, hundred million dollars? Like, and, and then being unable to sell it or spin it off, and say, I was very hurt by that. Eventually, uh, I, I moved to Google proper. We built. Uh, I, I worked notab notably on the build system Basel, which is uh, a build system, very interesting in many ways, like technologically great, but yet there, there were key things they didn't understand. They didn't understand modularity and community building and the different roles there are in a community of people who have to work together. And trying to explain it to them was impossible. I was I was speaking to a wall. Like we were not speaking the same language. It was not French versus English or whatever. No, there, there were even French people in the team, but we just like the, the state of mind was not the right one. So it was in, very interesting that. Google has a very bottom-up culture, like we, we're going to get the low-hanging fruit, et cetera, and they're very good at that. And I really admire Google for the ability to, to scale things from the bottom up. But that's not how I was raised. That's not what I like to do. I, I'm a top-down kind of guy, or at least I'm a guy who likes to understand things both ways. Like uh, That's my academic background, I suppose. I like to understand things. I like to build tall towers. I don't like to, to pile rocks and build pyramids. Mm -hmm. I want to build top concrete that, that go high in the sky and are, that are well thought out. And, and Google is great at pyramids. So excellent at pyramids, but I want to build towers. So I want that for them. Wow. I found that super inspiring and super um, flabbergasting uh, because uh, most of the time when I interview people, they tell me, oh, you know, that thing is too top down and we need more bottom up. And it's funny because we've been working together quite a lot. And it's the first time I hear somebody tell me, yeah, actually being top down is that great. And there are flaws in being bottom up. And that's interesting. 
I think the two are complementary. I don't think that everything should be top down, or everything should be bottom up. I, I admire Google at doing things that I cannot do, and I think they are flawed by do, not being able to think that I can do. And I, I was sad that there was ultimately miscommunication and misfit between the two. And I yearn to find a place where both bottom up and and top down meet, uh, and we can make meaning, and we can have both the short term. The things that work and that can get us funded and the low hanging fruits, but also we're going the right direction. We're not just uh, blindly advancing and uh, and only going to the next short term thing. So I think both are important. Wonderful. And so you le you left Google and then started. I went. No, at first I went to a company called. Bridgewater Associates. You may or may not have uh, uh, heard of them. And the founder who retired recently is Ray Dalio. And he's a very interesting guy who ha who published books on principles of management and principles of investment or something, finance or something, economics. And he, he, he was a very interesting guy who like, after having been bitten, he decided, oh, I'm going to to do everything according to rules that are justified, etc., and identify the underlying principle. And he published a book about that. And he wanted his entire company to be run according to this principle. And that is fascinating. So there are many things I agree or disagree about his principles, but I, I suppose at the meta level, the, the main thing is that these are principles that work for him in the context of the work that he had to do. But other people have different works and different contexts, and so they should have different priorities. Just because his principles are in, in some way universally right or universally interesting, but they don't universally have the priority. They are, in computer science, principles of design for software that apply and that take precedence over whatever management principles he has or whatever. And, and so, I think that his failure at the meta level is not considering that principles should, everyone should have his principles and, and every topic and every domain and every task should follow the principles that are most important for that task. But reading the, his books on principles of, of management and principles or whatever is fascinating. I recommend that for anyone interesting in, interested in improving their way of doing business or living, et cetera. It's very, very interesting. Anyway, I I also did not fit in the end in that company. I have many stories about that, but I learned a lot. I am glad I went there. I'm glad I left also. And after that, I decided, you know what? I don't fit in uh, big companies. I have my own ideas. I want to write software that is meaningful for topics that are meaningful. And so I became my own entrepreneur. And then from there, I went into cryptocurrencies. Wonderful. And so, um... How did you discover the blo blockchain world? Were you already familiar quite a bit with it before entering the, the industry as an entrepreneur, or did you just jump in it uh, as an entrepreneur? Well, I was familiar with blockchain because I'm a libertarian, and lots of libertarians were glossing about uh, Bitcoin back in 2009. Mm. And so uh, I remember I was at Parkfest in New Hampshire at, at the time, and wow, Bitcoin was big. One of the guys who, who got paid for selling burgers in, in, uh, in Bitcoin at, at Parkfest, like he made millions and, and retired <laughs> a, a the year after. It was very fun. Uh, but I, I found it Bitcoin is fun, but I have nothing to contribute to it. So I was looking for a far until my a few years later, like, you know, 2015, 13, I don't remember, late 15. Uh, my friend Arthur Brightman invited me to help him with uh, what became the Tezos white paper. And so I reviewed and co-authored a bit and we discussed and sometimes we disagreed. But uh, I think that in the end, some of the, agreed, the idea that we broke over, uh, eventually he he eventually agreed with my idea then. But anyway, uh, we broke, but we broke up, but I learned a whole lot. I, I hope that he did learn some for me, but I, I learned a whole lot about how to think about uh, crypto economics and uh, things like that. So it was, it was great collaborating with Arthur Brightman. And so years later, like 20, end of 2017, 2017, my, my, my brother had, had me read a lot of white papers and asking me, is it a shit coin like, uh, or is it worth it? Like, is this white paper, is there something in it or uh, is there nothing in it? 
And for most of the white papers she had me read, there was something, but next to that something, there was like, the guy had usually, the author had one good idea and all the rest was bad or not great and certainly subpar. And for three quarters of the papers, the good idea was a computer science idea. How do we make things scale better or safer or whatever? And the for twenty percent, they went fifth of the paper. It was more like this guy have a decent economic idea, but they don't understand technology and computer science at all. So there were only maybe five percent of the paper where the guy understood both economics and and technology, and those were the good papers. But in the end, I saw so many papers uh, that were claiming to scale something, but doing it with the wrong incentives that he said, you know, I, I can do the right design, especially with what I learned from Arthur, to do something that is, uh, that does scale and has the right incentives. And so I offered the, the design to Arthur, but at the time, Tezos had not launched. So Arthur asked, asked me, no, no, I don't have time to add features to Tezos. I want to remove features from Tezos. Why don't you use our smart contracts to do that? And I was like, what, 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 what? what? I'm offering you a scaling solution and you're telling me about smart contracts and that doesn't even make sense. Uh, first, I, I don't understand what smart contracts are for, if, if anything, and I had rejected a, a work offer before that uh, to work on smart contract because I don't understand I don't understand it, so I can't do it right. Uh, I can tell you your, your SRL smart contracts are way too low level, they're doing the wrong things, are the, you're thinking about smart contracts wrong, I can tell that, and they ask me, well, how do you think about smart contracts, right? Can you make them better? I say, well, I don't understand what smart contract is for, so I can't make it better. Mm -hmm. So no, I can't work for you. No. But uh, later, so I had this idea and I offered to Arthur, and Arthur asked me, why don't you use it smart contracts? So I tell Arthur, no, this is stupid, and I will going to explain you in a long email why this is totally stupid, why you're, you're an idiot, and why I'm telling you about scaling solutions, telling you about smart contracts, that two don't, like, don't even mix. So I write the, this argument on, on an email, and, and then, oh, oh, there's a small flaw in the argument. Okay, but that's okay, I, 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 I will fix the flaw. And, oh, there's another small flaw in the argument. Oh, and then there's a flaw in, at the end of the email, that, like a few paragraphs, I had written a conclusion that actually, wow, yes, you are right, and I was wrong, I was an idiot, not you. And yes, you can do, uh, scaling sense of smart contracts, and that's exactly what smart contracts are for. It's about describing the rules of in the interaction, and the scaling can happen in the interaction that you do off-chain or whatever. The contract defines the rules so that there's no way that the things can, can go wrong, and then you don't actually do, need to do most things on-chain. You can do everything off-chain. The contract is just there to uh, enforce the, the good behavior, and then you, and then you can use techniques such as uh, game semantic, so logical techniques. Uh, so I invented what later became known as optimism or uh, uh, something like that. And and so back in late 17, early 2018, and that's when, so since Osho was that interested, I started my own company, I did startup, I did the first startup. Um, and that's how I became a, a cryptocurrency startup. -er. So what was your first startup? Ah, it was called Lady Cash. And I I suppose I I got myself with the wrong associates. So I had a friend who was great, but she was maybe a bit of a sociopath and she didn't know when to stop. So but she 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 got me first with a, another friend of hers and who looked like the right guy. And I had never done really business. I had been a consultant, but not that that's good at the business part of being a consultant. And so this guy had done a great, uh, uh, well, great, a workable web, free, uh, web two business. And he wanted to get into web three and we kind of fit it off. Oh, this guy understands business. He can speak uh, technology, let, let's work together. But so we started this company called Legi Cash. We raised like $800,000. We founded another company associated called Alacris, and things went where they went. And 
Well, there was always some disagreement between me and the other co-founder, but that was okay. He was a CEO and he overrode me. And every time he does it, I was like, didn't like it, but well, that was okay. But I suppose something broke where when she made a mistake and she had hired a guy and the guy was actually useless and spent uh, maybe one quarter of the money we raised on doing something useless. And that was a mistake. And you know, everyone does mistakes. We, we all make mistakes. But what really irked me is when he didn't own the mistake and all he cared about was uh, papering over it. Or uh, and, and that's where I discovered like, this guy doesn't trust me, I don't trust him. And I can't work with someone who cannot own his mistakes. And maybe he had made the mistakes of himself, but he certainly didn't want to admit it to him, to, to me, and treat it as if I'm the So I had to break from him, and he made me a very bad offer, like you walk away, you get nothing. And I, what? I, I have 51% of this corporation, and I get away and get nothing, and you get the corporation and everything in it. So things got bad, I hired... Oh, no. What? I say, how I had no. a, Yeah, uh, I had a lawyer. I, I ex instead of him ejecting me, I ejecting him because I had the majority part, even though he had tried to, to tweak the, the rules of the, the company. But you know, whatever the rules of company are, if you have the majority, you can change the rules. So that's what I did. Okay, the, you, you, you have split the rules of company, the company against me, but I've got the majority, so. I, Got the part. So that that was a bad business divorce, and I, I learned a lot. And I think the week that the that the thing happened, I, I I grew I grew up an inch. Like I had to to be my own man. And uh, uh, this entrepreneur, I wish him the best. I just wish to never meet him again. Um, and in the end, it's not once again. It's not that he made mistakes. Making mistakes, everyone can. Make. I, I would. I would forgive all the mistakes. It's just like not owning up to it and not treating me as a partner. But uh, and you need partners that that you trust and that you can work with. And so actually, the lawyers that I I, I hired to help me, uh, we really hit it off. We respected each other, and he he joined me in the new. He was also wanted to to go into crypto business, so we we joined up. And his name was Alex Smart and. Uh, at, at, at first, I, I went back to my uh, slightly sociopathic friend. She was she was there to help uh, get rid of my f former CEO who had fired her. But I tried to be partner with her, but it was, it was too much. As she, at the end, we were spending like fifty percent of the time both me and Alex just dealing with her uh, didn't work. She. Anyway, she had me get a new CEO, and I had said yes, but the new CEO actually didn't have a CEO. So after a while, we had to say, okay, are you a CEO, not a CEO? And he left. And that was also another way of learning. Okay, well, you need to make decisions faster of letting people go, and you have to give them a deadline to make to make their mind. So once again, another guy wishing the best, but uh, um, he was not made to work with us. And then after everyone left and the two people left were uh, me and Alex, we decided, hey, we like each other, we want to work together. So we we became partners. And uh, at first he was my CEO and I was a CEO, but uh, after a while, especially after my divorce, where I had much less time to be a CEO, he took over the CEO and he was, a, I think, a very good CEO. And I enjoyed working with him very well, very much. I really enjoy the fact that we can disagree peacefully. So I'm in topics where we disagree. Uh, he, I think something, he thinks something else. And I yield or he yields. But either either way, we stay friends. We can keep arguing. We can keep working together and respect each other. And that's very important in, in a partner, someone you can actually work with who respects you as a partner. And sure, we have to have disagreement. And that's fine. And. Uh, management lesson for the people listening to us a good partner uh, is managing the conflicts with you without bragging about a victory there's no pride in victory over somebody who disagrees if that person is a friend no hard feelings yeah. but no pride as well as well and yes um, <laughs> that's I, I, would, I, would, I would like to say that about uh, another partner that we got along the way uh hawker uh, alex hogberger our chief product officer uh, 
we I had lots of developments with, with Hawk. Uh, and sometimes I think I went wrong to Bethany. Uh, but, but in the end, what matters is that we, we work together and we, we build something together. And often I find, oh, he was right and I was wrong. And, uh, and I respect that. The fact that we can disagree in a way that, that uh, is uh, that is productive. Productive disagreement. So if you are, if you are into entrepreneurship, I will tell you having partners is very important. Having a team of people around you to complement you because you're not perfect. And even if you're perfect, you don't have, you have, don't have infinite time and you can't do everything. So surrounding yourself with people that you can work with, complement yourself. So if they complement you, they won't agree with you on everything. And you have to recognize, yes, uh, they are right or sometimes they're wrong, but sometimes even if they're wrong, it's better to, to delegate to them. And on average, they will be writers and wronger than wrong. So that's fine. So know who to delegate, know who to delegate to. And that's that's what, that's the biggest lesson I got from entrepreneurship, yes. You know, you know that's, one, you. Uh, that's one of the things I find the most interesting when every time I'm coaching young entrepreneurs, not, not necessarily young uh, in age, but young uh, in the meaning that they, uh, they are building their first company, uh, every time they underestimate the importance of partners and you, you can't put the emphasis enough on how important this is. And, uh, and even myself as an entrepreneur, I knew it and I fell in the pitfall, my, in the pitfalls myself. And, uh, I, I feel my motivation shrinking when I feel that I can't trust the business partner anymore. It's like, yeah. like the, my, my mental, mental load is, is much less tolerable, tolerable. I don't know if it's the same uh, for you, but. Uh, and when uh, you don't fit with someone, it doesn't mean that they are a bad person. Sometimes they are a very good person, just like not the right fit for you and uh, good luck for them in a different setting. And, and it's good to know what works for you. So uh, find, out, find out what works for you. Uh, but there are also still efforts that you have to do like, on yourself. Like, oh, I, I was wrong or I need to listen better, listen more. And uh, you, you will, if you've never had partners before, you will learn a lot and you will have to recognize that you were wrong a lot. And and that's fine, and, uh, and grow up. And so then you created mutual knowledge. Well, I'm not going to develop that too much because people know what mutual knowledge is. This is the podcast and this is the products we're building. Uh, but what kind of uh, issue in the blockchain industry were you willing to fix in the first place when you developed Moon? Okay, so I suppose the key issue there are two key issues that I've always been uh, interested in scaling and uh, smart contracts or lang language extensions or in general, the semantics or interactions. Okay. So when I finally understood what smart contracts are, smart contracts, I like to describe them as, actually it's not a smart contract, it's decentralized applications. Decentralized applications, are interactions between multiple parties, two or more parties, who don't fully trust each other. Who don't fully trust each other, but want to interact, and they have rules for the interactions. They will define the rules of the game for what is the right, right interaction. And these rules have to be automatically enforceable. If, it, if there's no automation, then go back to regular contracts. But you can do a smart contract if at least the, the usual, the normal case of the interaction can be fully automated. So like, and sometimes, yeah, yeah. sometimes it's a case of fall back to have oh we, we need an oracle if if there's a disagreement and we'll fall back to to some humans somewhere somewhere else. But the, the normal the normal of the interaction are fully automatable or fully then uh, expressible in in some language that describes the interaction and algorithmically and, and you will trade resources on that that are that are on blockchain or something. So you can trade resource between people who don't trust each other according to algorithmically verifiable rules. And that's what decentralized applications are. And the smart contract is only the part that describes the rules on the blockchain. But most of the interaction actually happens off chain. Most of the interactions happen between you and I directly. And we don't have to, to involve anyone else. Actually, the, in as much as there is a, an analogy between smart contract uh, and law and, and real contract, the analogy is that in one case, like the other, you don't want to see the judge. You only, if you write, when you write a contract, the goal of the contract is not to see the judge and, and argue the contract. The, the goal of the contract is the contract is so well written and so clear 
that it's very clear who will win uh, if in, in what case and what other case. Therefore, I will do my part and you will do your part because if I don't do my part, I will be punished. If you don't do your part, you will be punished. And the only case where we see the judge is if one of us or both of us is a blockhead or, or is there something very subtle that neither of us had seen in, this, in the contract and now uh, we have to resolve it. But the, the normal case is we write the we don't write the contract to see the judge. We write the contract to not see the judge. You don't write the smart contracts so that you can evaluate it on the blockchain. You write the smart contract so that you never have to evaluate it on the blockchain, and that's my view of smart contracts. So you write a smart contract that you track all the rules of interaction and do all the interaction with you and I, and everything happens off chain except in the beginning, we register the smart contract on chain to make sure that everything will be fine. At the end, we write a settlement, but in between. We never talk to each, uh, we never talk on uh, on chain. We only talk to each other. The chain is just like the judge or the, the courthouse. You never go to the courthouse. You register your, your company at the beginning. You register the settlement at the end, and that's uh, as little as you you do with with the law with the courthouse. Wonderful. And so, in the current blockchain industry. Um, do you think that these rules are getting well understood by people? Uh, oh, <laughs> so both in the tech sector and corporate, or is there uh, one side like between the corporate and the tech sector which is more redeemable than the other? Uh, a lot of good things and bad things to say about the, the crypto industry. Obviously, if I'm there, because I, I think all the good things uh, are better than the bad things, but. Um, uh, there, there is or has been too much easy money in, in, in the in the industry, which means lots of scammers, or even lots of people who are not scammers, but who made it too much, too easy, too, too early, and, and think they are genius and know it, know it all. So then the, they can focus on what they know and, and, and think that they know that they don't need to delegate on other things because they know it all. There, there, are, there are exceptions. I, I like the exception. Places like such as uh, Cardano or Falcon, with, with whom that's not a project we've worked with them uh, because they understand that they need the broadest range of talent and the broadest uh, amount of topics to, to make a solid ecosystem. There are plenty of ecosystems where the founder thinks he knows everything, so he will hire you and the things he knows about, and he will hire no one and people he doesn't know about, and, and then nothing happened, or he has a very unbalanced or biased ecosystem that does some things very right and other things very wrong. But the guys of Cardano and Falcon and, 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 and others uh, know how to delegate. And I, I like to, that's why we work with them because they, they understand, uh, yes, the need to to gather talent and a broad base of talent. And so we, we recently had Moon have been uh, um, granted, a, uh, have received a grant from Ripple. So uh, we're also, Ooh. We yes. are also going to uh, to have this name uh, um, in our Hall of Fame, so we will be able to have advice on them soon. Yes, but uh, so yeah, okay. So there's all plenty of good things and bad things about uh, Web3. I, I think that one of the good things also is that a lot of people there understand that we are building a, an alternative, a Plan B to uh, the current centralized financial system. And maybe some people in the industry, no, no, this is a plan A, the plan B, the, the centralized finance will uh, fall over and kill over and, and implode. And I think that's a definite possibility. And, but I still think that, of course, the existing financial institutions are the plan A and there, there, there remains a plan A until they very quickly disappear and and give way to something else if that happens, if and when that happens. But uh, it, it's a plan A until it's no, it's no longer a plan A. So there's a chance, that's a good chance, I mean, non-negligible chance that Bitcoin and or other cryptocurrencies will become the plan A instead of the US dollar or the euro and whatever else again. But we have to admit that's, that's only a plan B. And hopefully because there is a plan B, it puts pressure on the plan A to not, to not implode and not do the wrong thing. Because now they know, oh, if we inflate too much, if we do too many bad things, 
we will disappear and be replaced by, by Bitcoin and other things like that. So hopefully the existence of Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc., will put pressure on the financial system to do the right thing. Just like, oh, Bitcoin has too conservative in many ways and uh, many things it doesn't do right. But hopefully the existence of Ethereum will, will help Bitcoin do the right thing or Bitcoin doesn't do the right thing and then becomes taken over by Ethereum or Cardano or Solana or whatever it is. So the, thing, the, the competition does not just provide something that, that is better or not better. The competition also helps the contender uh, puts pressure on the contender to, to get better and to stay to stay ahead. So I, I, I like that about uh, cryptocurrency, even if cryptocurrency would never become the plan A and the thing, which is possible, even if it doesn't happen, it will still put a pressure on the financial system to do the right thing. And I think that's important. So yeah, it's a, swore, a sword of Damocles above their head, just saying, hey, don't get too cocky. There's, there's a, another yeah. way for people. And so what are the factors driving adoption in your opinion? So of course, many people are talking about friction and user experience, but in terms of capabilities, what is uh, hindering the, the decentralized world from taking over? We, we awesome. have many, many legal reasons, many, uh, many UX reasons, but um, from your tech expert perspective, what, uh, is there also a tech hindrance? I think there are many technological challenges, but most of them, I think, are not, I think that obviously will be solved sooner or later. I think like scalability, I think that will be solved sooner or later, and I'm working on it. And uh, the smart contract, how to write smart contracts the right way, I think that can be solved also. The thing that there's a, there's a problem that is intrinsic is the fact that self-custody is hard. In the end, Cryptocurrency is about you control your your own your own crypto tokens, whatever. So there's a Bitcoiners that is saying, not your keys, not your token. And that's right. It means that, oh well, if someone else holds the keys, they control the token, it's functionally theirs or or they are in charge. And similarly if you lose your keys or if you lose your token because your key is leaked or someone Get hacks your into your computer, crack your computer. Well, you you use a token, and that, that, that sucks. And there's no authority to to give back your token. The whole point of the decentralized network is that there's no more a central authority that will inflate, that will freeze your account, that will uh, seize your accounts. And, and people say, oh, this is a third world behavior. No, it happened in the first world, like. Using account, Cyprus in the Eurozone has seized the accounts of many people or seized part of the accounts of everyone. Uh, Canada has frozen the accounts of political dissidents during the, first, the famous trucker uh, demonstration. Like you gave, like you were a grandmother, you gave money to your grandson who was a trucker, your account was frozen. So freezing the accounts of political dissidents is the thing. Censoring the transaction in the US, the government is trying to make life dif difficult for for people who sell guns or drugs that are legal locally, but not at the federal level, or prostitution or sex work or whatever, the government is doing all it can to censor, to prevent people from using the banking system. So well, even the first world issue, if the government doesn't like you, they will take your money or prevent you from transacting um, famously the Assange and his uh, WikiLeaks who reveal the crimes of the US government mm -hmm. instead of the government being like uh, uh, reformed and the people who committed crimes into jail or at least fired from their job, at, at the very least fired from their job uh, or, or reprimanded, at the very least reprimanded for doing the bad thing. No, 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 yeah, no. At least get it's, their it's, fingers slapped or something. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly. Or recall now, oh yes, we, we did something wrong. No, 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 no. They, they, they are planning that Assange has been uh, in functional prison and actual prison for for decades, uh, and so and of course the first thing they did was to cut all the payments to to, to his uh, his organization. Mm -hmm. So if an op if you're a dissident, even in the first world, you'll have a, a problem, and, and this thing is only getting worse. They're inflating the money supply like crazy to fund their stupid wars. Um, so so the plan A is going badly. And that's why the plan B matters all, all the more. And I wish the plan A to not go bad, but unhappily, I, 
I can't swear that we'll, plan A won't do so well. And it's interesting to see that many people advocating censorship usually advocate that censorship uh, or that uh, the freezing of the, of the funds until they get, they are the ones getting frozen. And many people are, are always saying, yes, China is bad because they can freeze your funds if you criticize their government. And yes, you know, sometimes it's bad because the U.S. does this or that or Russia is bad or Israel is bad or Palestine is bad. But every t uh, or people will say Trump is bad because there was this issue, issue with the ban of the of the SWIFT network. Uh, in some uh, some places Trump didn't like, or the Trump administration at the very least. And funnily, people usually only c um, condemn the, the freezing of the funds only when it's for, for the people who don't think correctly. Yeah. That's tribalism. People don't understand that uh, uh, abuse of power, that, po that they don't have power. The problem is that there is this democratic myth of representation where people think they are represented whatever represented means i think represented is actually a, a big lie it's a, an usurpation of the relationship between a, a client and attorney an attorney represents his client because the client also writes things representing him on a specific topic for a limited purpose uh, and then the attorney can speak in for for the client and also very important uh, the client can recuse the attorney and the client can sue the attorney if the attorney acts against his interest. And so that, that's what representation is, typically, and that's what the word means. But there is no representation whatsoever between me and a politician that is elected. First, I didn't vote for him. Then uh, if he does wrong me wrong, I cannot sue him back. I cannot revoke it. I cannot revoke the, the, the representation. There's nothing of a representation. That's, a, 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 that's an interpretation of the word, like just taking that social contract. There's no social contract. A contract is something that you can voluntary sign you can change you can recuse uh, and there's no social contract when you didn't agree to anything and all these are other patients by the state yes of, the semantic usurpation. yes that semantic usurpation, just like the the the, the, the tainted your father a father of figure or mother of figure no, that, that's that's all the patient or the state has science and knows and now if you are not uh, in the uh, accreditation and by the state, you're not a true scientist, only uh, someone who has been in the state uh, accredited university as a real scientist, and that's science. And you know, that's, that's all usurpation. Like, the state is, the establishment is usurpating all the sources of authority and claiming it for them. And people fall for it. It's working. I have to, to give them credit. Like, uh, uh, yeah, good it, predators. It, it, you, you, can, uh, you can acknowledge the, the predator and say, okay, you're a very yeah. skilled yes. predator. Yes, I, I have. I have admiration. I have respect. You should not, you should not despise your enemy. You just should recognize. Oh, these, these guys are my enemies, and they are not my friends. But you should not say, oh, they are evil and they're stupid and uh, crazy. No, they are not. They, they may be evil if you want, but they are neither stupid nor crazy, and uh, and they are not you. And if you think that, oh, these guys are not us, but those guys are us. You're wrong. It's like you're being played. Like, yes, you hate Trump because Trump is obviously the wrong guy. But then you fall into the uh, the Bidens and other things who are just as bad. Uh, or, or the opposite. You you fall for Trump because you really recognize how bad Biden is. And that's one advantage of being a, a foreigner. I, I'm a French guy living in, in, in the U.S. Uh, before that, I was a whole Vietnamese guy living in France. Being an outsider, you can see through the lies. Like, as the French guy, aren't they both obviously corrupt? Yes. And re conversely, if you are living in the US, you look at French politics. Aren't these guys obviously stupid uh, and, and corrupt? Yeah, of course. So it's just like when you're in the middle, you're in it, and you're being bombarded with messages, you're being propagandized since you were a kid, and you don't see the, you don't see that you're being played, but really being an outsider yeah you can, i can see these guys are being played and, mm, you know, and i don't and, and sometimes i run to web3 and crypto too like there are obvious scammers like people like yes. uh, Sam Bankman freed or whatever who are obvious scammers from the beginning uh, and people fall for that oh the guy is uh, claims to be uh what uh, what, what did he claim to be like uh, uh, ethical like uh, altruism or whatever like that 
Oh my Almost god. If, you, if you, you just have to say that you're the good guy and usually it it, it works. But you know regarding <laughs> regarding the the fact that you can't win against a system that you're fueling it's uh, it's very I, I had a very sad conversation with a, a very sad albeit very brief conversation with um, a person from the yellow jackets movement in uh, in Paris because I well <laughs> this is where I live so I was seeing that on a daily basis. And uh, I had the opportunity to talk with a guy who had lost a limb um, because, of, because of the French police. So uh, the guy had lost a, a limb um, also because of uh, 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 you know, a panicked decision in the middle of the riot. And uh, in the end, he was very happy because he, his lawyer, his attorney, had a very good hope to, to get him refunded and to get him some compensation. So it's very hard to assess the, 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 the true value of a limb, but usually when you're missing an eye or a hand, the, the, your life afterwards is not that cool. Uh, at least it's you have to, to get some adaptation, so you, you'd better get quite a lot of money to refund that. But in the end, I just asked the guy, but you do realize that the money that will be used to refund you in the lawsuit will be money that basically comes from all of you guys mostly right and you, and you're the, the guy had that breakdown and I, I i even i almost felt guilty because i kind of ruined his spirit for the day and I, I saw the guy really you know trying to readjust his yellow jacket and on the back of his yellow jacket uh, was written all the the battles he had fought like all the the dates of the of the protests and riots he had attended and he I saw the guy, you know, pondering, and uh, oh shit! Oh, that's true. Actually, they they're going to repay me with with money. I'm going to repay them anyway. Uh, and the, and it was it was super sad because at the same time the guy was really really in in disfavor of decentralized systems uh, because he said, "How are we going to to control centralized power if the power is decentralized?" And um, how are we co how are we going to control the 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 ultra rich who are getting rich mostly because of state subsidies and uh, uh, and oh. and state helps and yeah m many people do not really understand the benefits of this decentralization even though oh. they they deeply suffer from centralization. Well, there will always be a rich and poor people. The question is. Are there powerful people who are above the law or not? And centralized does not uh, solve the problem. It puts some people above the law, the people who enforce the law. And they, oh, yes, but we have a, a system of laws and a place for everyone. Well, yeah, but if, Meh, a place for everyone, if, there, if there's discretion, like the prosecutorial discretion, they choose who they apply it or not, the, the cops are always, uh, in the US, the cops lie in court all the time and they're always friends with the judges. Uh, the politicians name the, the the judges, so there's plenty of revolving doors everywhere. They are they are they are raised in the same schools. If you don't think the same way as they as they do, they will not uh, nominate you anywhere anyway. So the system protects its own, and sure there are some internal dissension between the system, and that in a way that's also what what makes uh, the Western system stronger because it's slightly more decentralized than say Russia or China, but uh, when the system against you, the system is against you. The system is not your friend. It's just that it's more internally decentralized, like the Montesquieu's like a division of powers into three branches or bullshit like that. It it does not stop the system being above you and you being under it. It just okay make the system uh, less responsible and less accountable and more uh, dysfunctional in a way. So. Um, Instead of wanting a dysfunctional system that can that can't harm, harm you because it's dysfunctional, yes, but that means that when it helps you also it's dysfunctional. No, what you need is something that's functional where people are actually accountable for what they do. And accountability is a key word and that's what decentralization brings. Like no one is above above the law. And uh, I think that's the most important thing. Because the law Oh. Any centralized theory actually has some people above the law, who, name, namely the people who have the monopoly on applying it or not applying it and deciding how it's going to be applied. Good. Who, who shall watch the watchman? 
it's uh, or which was basically yeah. the, the philosophical spirit of the first Bitcoin white paper. It was a manifesto yeah. uh, following the subprime crisis, saying like, "Do uh, guys, we've been totally wrecked by centralized power and um, state-driven inflation and and bad incentive games." Too big to fail. Too yeah. big to fail. Like basically, the the banks were incentivized by the state to take all the risk because oh, if we win, we win big and we get large bonuses, and if we lose, well, that's okay. We don't. We don't lose, the, the state loses, and the taxpayer loses, and, and they pay us. And uh, that's, 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 that's not capitalism, that's just uh, a game by the establishment where, where the pseudo capitalists, uh, they're, they're one side of the capitalists. They have the, the positive side of the capitalists without the negative side of the capitalists, without the accountability. So it's, uh, it's all fake, and you're, you're, you're getting played. We are getting, we are getting played. The, the normal capitalist, the real capitalist thing is, oh, the bank failed. Well, there's a procedure for that. It's called bankruptcy. The, 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 the shareholders are wiped out. And what remains of the asset is returned between the creditors. So that's a normal way of doing things between uh, in the capitalist country. And if there's an insurance, if there's an insurance, well, the insurance will cover the insurance. Or in this case, because FDIC should have covered the the, the depositors, but you, you don't save the shareholder. Saving the shareholders is obviously like theft. Uh, the, the shareholders should pay and should lose the money. That's the whole point of being a shareholder, uh, even if they are not sued. Uh, and and, and uh, the officer should be sued for if they if they did malpractice or anything. Uh, also, but not, no officer was sued, uh, or they all got their bonuses. No problem. The shareholders were were saved by the government. So it's all, it's all a game, it's all a shell game and you're, you're being played. There's, there's not the, it has appearance of capitalism, which is better than no capitalism at all. Don't get me wrong. Like if you're in Russia or China, it's even worse. Like uh, the government just takes takes what you have and sends you to, to Gulag yeah, and- uh, You can still, you can still um, criticize the system despite yeah. acknowledging that there are many worse alternatives than this one, of course. Oh, oh yeah, the worst system. Like, uh, you can say, oh, here are all the ways that the US or the French system are broken, and yes, they are, but you, you uh, would still be happier living in France than in China or Russia. Uh, that's, uh, like, there are levels of problem. Broken is not a pure one thing. Like, there are levels of broken. Well, thank you so much, Fare, for this first interview. And you thank have you. any last word? Well, uh, thank you for having me. I have so many more things. I, I thought it would talk more about techniques than about... Oh, that's the point of the next episode. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm looking forward to discussing more technology with you next time. Thank you, Gauthier. Well, everyone, this was Faré, a.k.a. François René Rideau, co-founder and president of Mutual Knowledge Systems. Uh, and we will hear him again in the um, in, uh, next episode soon. Uh, don't uh, miss our geek talk starting next week with geeks, namely Faré, of course, but many other people talking about the tech they're developing and many more tech focused discussions because you guys in the comment section asked for this as well so this is what we're going to do and of course you'll have more entrepreneurs and more people of the blockchain industry all year round in the mutual knowledge podcast follow us everywhere twitter youtube instagram whatever cheers everyone bye Fare. thanks thanks au revoir au revoir